Hello, hello, hello. Går den igennem til side?
tester. <coughs> so, uh, welcome back everyone. I hope lunch was good. Um, it's my pleasure today to introduce our next keynote speaker. And uh, as the keynote is um, presented by Kurs, uh, which you also can see in the program, uh, I want to um, leave a few words to Kurs. Kurs is the Zentrum für kleine und regionale Sprachen. So it's the Center for Small and Regional Languages at the University of Flensburg. And it's um, yeah, a cooperation of linguistic departments of uh, several institutes, uh, the Roman, Danish, Low German and German, and the Frisian um, Institute are involved there. And the main goal is academic exchange, um, for, for example, in lecture series, but we also like to invite people, like Yanni today, um, uh, to uh, get in a broader exchange and not only focus on the language departments included in course. Uh, we already did a teaser, a kind of teaser for this conference uh, a year ago, um, where we uh, welcomed Miren and Sergius and Craig, for example, uh, and we're happy that the conference now finally uh, takes place here. <laughs> um, yeah, that, that about course, but uh, the main focus is on Yanni today. Um, she's from Helsinki University, or uh, Helsingfors, um, because she's member of the Swedish-speaking community in Finland. And uh, that also reflects in her research interests. But um, before there was the research, uh, Jenny was in journalism and media, but then switched to academia. And um, she's uh, researching language, language ideologies in uh, radio and television, and uh, that was the title of your PhD, which uh, was publicated in uh, 2018, right? <laughs> so, uh, standard language and language standards among uh, speakers of uh, or among um, Finland Swedish broadcasts and broadcast news. But your um, focus is on minority language media, but also social media, uh, linguistic practices, and language ideologies. And that's pretty cool because um, that fits very well into our course program, um, uh, which is why we're very happy that you're here today. Today isn't so much about uh, social media as I noticed, but more on uh, the journalistic part and uh, journalistic ideas, professional identity and language policy, perspectives on educating minority language journalists. The floor is yours. Thank you, Helken. <laughs> uh, first, I'd like to ask our tech people if I could get this picture on that screen. Thank you. Um, yes, thank you for the invitation. I'm really happy to be here. Um, I work as a university lecturer in journalism at the Swedish School of Social Science, which is a separate uh, autonomous Swedish language unit within the University of Helsinki. Uh, it's also called Sossokom in short, so I will be referring to that name as well, so you'll know what I'm talking about. Um, 
I will talk about perspectives on educating minority language journalists today, and I will start with a quote from one of my first year students. I feel that it's important to be able to express myself in my own mother tongue. My language skills would be on a much lower level if I wrote in Finnish or English, for instance. Working in Swedish in Finland has its pros and cons compared to working in Sweden. However, it feels like an honor to contribute to the vitality of Swedish in Finland. This summarizes some of the points I'll be making today, the importance of being able to work and express oneself in one's own language, language skills um, in general as well, um, and um, the mission of minority language journalists, the ideology, um, why they are doing their job is something we're going to discuss as well. And of course the job market, working for a minority or for a majority language, that's also important. So, what's so special about minority language media? Well, I guess that question doesn't have to be posed in this room because we've heard very, very many aspects on why we need minority language media. It's about helping the language, helping a mi language minority in different ways. And as Cormac says, media provision in a minority language answers human rights claims and helps in the important work of preserving as much of human language and culture as possible. This is no small task. But this is about minority language media. And media and journalism are not the same thing. So what does this mean for minority language journalism? This is something we'll be discussing today. Uh, as a conceptual frame of reference, I will use 10 categories of questions posed to journalism education formulated by Mark Ducey but I will also draw upon my own experience of teaching journalism. But first, I will give you a brief introduction to the language situation in Finland so that you will know where I come from. Here you see a map of Finland, uh, and the red parts are the ones where most of the Swedish-speaking people are living. Um, the red part on the left side there, uh, in in the middle, that's called Ostrobotnia, and that's one big area where Swedish-speaking people live, and also in the southern region uh, in the west, uh, on the Åland Islands, and uh, around the Helsinki region, the capital region. There are two national languages in Finland, Finnish and Swedish. So Swedish is not a minority language by definition, but it is a minoritized language. And um, about 5.2% are registered as Swedish speaker. You can register one, tongue, one mother tongue, one language, which means that we have constant figures about how many speak different languages, but on the other hand, they're not telling the whole truth because naturally we have a lot of bilingual, bilingualism and trilingualism and multilingualism. But according to the official numbers, um, we have 5.2% uh, uh, Swedish speakers, that's about 290,000 individuals, and um, about 2,000 Sami speakers, the three Sami languages, uh, Inari Sami, Skolt Sami, and uh, Northern Sami. But uh, according to some numbers I've seen, they might be about 10,000 actually knowing Sami languages. And then of course other uh, languages as well. Uh, Russian, I think, being the major uh, immigrant language, or the biggest immigrant language. Um, we belonged to Sweden for a long time, for several hundred years, uh, until the war between Sweden and Russia in 1808 and 1809, and um, became independent in 1917. So that's the history. So we have a lot in common with Sweden um, when looking at society and social structures and so forth. Um, we have a separate Swedish school system, so from kindergarten to universities you can attend schools in Swedish. We also have a Swedish military brigade uh, giving education in Swedish uh, and a separate unit within the main church uh, operating in Swedish as well. So it's a, it's a strong language in that sense. 
and uh, the cooperation with the Nordic countries is very important for Finland and especially for the Swedish speaking parts of Finland um, in many different areas and of course language being the, the unifying factor. Now more than ever of course cooperation and discussions about national security and defense issues. Uh, language is has very strong, the Swedish language has very strong rights uh, in the Finnish constitution. It says that the public authorities shall provide for the cultural and societal needs of the Finnish speaking and Swedish speaking populations of the country on an equal basis. So this is the foundation that we're standing on. And we also have a language act saying that the purpose of this act is to ensure the constitutional rights of every person to use his or her own language, either Finnish or Swedish, before courts and other authorities. The goal is to ensure the right of everyone to a fair trial and good administration, irrespective of language, and to secure the linguistics right, r linguistic rights of an individual person without him or her needing specifically to refer to these rights. So this looks very good on paper. Unfortunately, it's not as rosy in reality. Um, the knowledge of Swedish is, is diminishing among the Finnish speaking majority and it's becoming increasingly hard to get service in Swedish also by the authorities. The media situation is uh, fairly good, I would say. Uh, the Finnish broadcasting company YLE has a separate Swedish language unit called Svenska Yle, Swedish YLE. And we have two radio channels, one for the young audience and one more broader, with a broader spectrum, also regional programs, and a shared channel, television channel spot with a Finnish cultural science uh, channel. We also have quite many newspapers um, in the southern parts. We have Rugusasbladet, which is the main newspaper in the capital region, and two others, one in the east and the west. And in Ostrobotnia, we also have three newspapers. Uh, in Åbo, Turku in Finnish, which was the old capital, we have also a Swedish newspaper and a bilingual newspaper in, in Paragas, uh, a bit off of a few hundred kilometers uh, away from Helsinki. And the Åland Islands also have their own newspapers too, actually, and some radio and television programs. So the media outlets are many and diverse, and these are the more official media. Then we, of course, also have more uh, independent players, like we saw in Ellen's picture yesterday, very different types of players. Here are some of them, uh, just to give an example. Uh, the one on the left with the pink is uh, from a p Facebook page for a podcast. It's like a fan page for a podcast um, with uh, 5,000 members. So that's quite a lot for just a podcast, and this is a humor-based podcast. Um, the one in the middle, now I think these pictures are really small for you here in the room at least. The one in the middle is of a TikTok star, an influencer, a young Swedish girl from a small town. And she's not doing TikToks in, in a language per se, but she is uh, Swedish speaking. And you probably can't see it, but she has the Finnish and the Swedish flag there uh, in her profile. And she has over 4 million followers. And another example is uh, dialects. We have a lot of dialects uh, in the Swedish language in Finland. And this uh, third picture here is from uh, Tumpis Memes. He's doing humor in dialect. Uh, and uh, he does a lot about our president, who you might know became a father in, in very, or more, he's, in a se he's a senior father, <laughs> if you call him that. And um, here is a, a recent picture of him uh, discussing with Putin, and he says something like this, that what are you thinking about? Uh, when I was 69, I didn't start a war, I made a child. So this is also part of the media content. Just briefly about uh, SOSOCOM, the Swedish School of Social Science. Um, it started in 43, journalism education started in 66 on a regular basis, and it became part of the University of Helsinki in 84. 
We have about 450 students, so it's a small uh, unit uh, with about 60 mm, lecturers and uh, researchers. The languages of instruction are Swedish, mainly, and English, but basically no Finnish. But of course, the uh, University of Helsinki is uh, trilingual with, with Finnish uh, as the main language. So we have a bachelor's program in social sciences, which the, uh, the journalism uh, education is part of, and a bachelor's program in social work, and also a master's program in social science. And about 10 to 15 students each year choose journalism and communication as their main subject. Okay, coming to the main points then. Um, in an extensive literature re review of studies about journalism education, uh, Mark Ducey has identified 10 key debates facing journalism educators around the globe and many similar aspects. Uh, none of them had anything to do with language or minority groups. And I guess this is something that we all can relate to in our research fields. There isn't that much about language or minority groups. Anyway, uh, he operationalized these uh, analytical categories to questions facing journalism educators. And um, questions you should ask yourself if you're planning to start a journalism program. And I will use these uh, and apply them to a minority language setting. So just briefly go through them first. Uh, motivation, why start a journalism education program? What's the reasons behind that? Paradigm, what set of ideas guide journalism education? Mission, what's the position of the journalism education uh, in regards to the profession and uh, the society and publics? Orientation, on what aspects of journalism is the education based? Is it on, for example, genres or a specific platforms? Direction, what are the ideal characteristics of those graduating? Are they specialists or generalists or something else? Contextualization, in what social context is journalism education grounded? And how is it interacting with society? Education, uh, is journalism education a socializing or an individualizing agent? Are the students learning the tricks of the trade or becoming more independent thinkers? And uh, curriculum, the balance between different types of courses, uh, method, ped pedagogy, and uh, management and organization. I will not discuss all of these in detail, don't worry. Uh, I will focus on some of them and uh, just briefly touch upon the rest. And I know that, of course, all minority languages work in very different uh, environments and, and have different resources and are some are really small and some are more large. But I hope that the thoughts here can be give you ideas and, and that way will bring something to all of you, regardless of the situation or the context that you are working in. So we'll start with uh, motivation. Uh, in Deuce's uh, article, he states that journalism research and education should help to build and sustain the professional self-organization of journalism and contribute to the establishment, development and application of quality assessment tools for journalistic practice. So this is very important. Professionalism and high standards, high quality is extremely important also in minority language media. And... Um, as I think someone said in the panel last night, that we need to be at least as good as everyone else. So this is a very high, high reference to try to uh, reach. And to do that, we need uh, education for minority language journalists as well. Uh, professional journalists can uh, help uh, develop, uh, develop the quality of the media, but also perhaps uh, be initiators of new media initiatives. So I think we could, with more professional journalists working in the minority media market, we could get uh, larger audiences to find the prof outlets that are there and maybe uh, get new outlets as, as well. So there's a win-win situation here. Um, we need education programs in minority languages. Uh, 
and or at least with courses in minority languages. This is especially um, brought forward uh, by researchers of indigenous journalism in the global south. Um, but I would say that it serves everybody just as well, because you can't do journalism for and with a minority if you don't know that language, of course, and be able to work in that language. Um, something to think about uh, if educating minority language journalists. Are we educating them for the minor minority language media market or for a bigger market? Um, the minority language media might be quite extensive, <coughs> as in, in Finland, but it doesn't have to be. So the minority language media market is probably not enough. We need to think about a bigger picture. And the implications for education might then be that we need to have also courses in the majority languages, for example, or the majority politics and social structures. When looking at the linguistic landscape for, for Swedish journalists in Finland, we see uh, a multiple, well, a complex picture in a way. Uh, in the center there we have the Swedish standard language uh, in Finland, affected by the Swedish dialects, uh, the S Swedish Swedish standard language uh, spoken in Sweden and Swedish dialects spoken there. Of course, Finnish influences, English influences, and other languages influence, uh, influence the Swedish standard in Finland. So this language mm, area is very complex. And when looking at um, what the become journalists to become think of this, uh, it's very interesting to see how they reason. Uh, I've done a very small survey with the students for a couple of years and asked them uh, which languages they feel comfortable working in and where they think they will be working after they graduate. So they could choose several, several uh, answers here. And um, almost everyone chooses Swedish as their one of the languages they can uh, work in, but also Finnish and English. And English is even st strong a stronger language than Finnish. And when I ask them where they think that they will work in which country or in which language, um, 35 out of 45 uh, say uh, Swedish and Finland, and 15 say f Finnish in Finland, whereas uh, 17 say uh, in Sweden, that they think they'll work in Sweden. And 25 think that they will work in English. So uh, they have a very large job market waiting for them if they have the ability to work in all these languages and in all these um, areas. Uh, and one important uh, or interesting detail is that the ones who felt that they were able to work in Finnish, only two of them chose Sweden as a potential market. So language proficiency is, is very important here. But this has implication if you think about the education. You cannot focus only on the minority uh, market. You have to think bigger than that. Paradigm then, the most important question maybe. So uh, if we uh, think about the minority language um, journalism, we need to start by asking ourselves, what is that? Sabaleta uh, et al. suggests that um, in the case of minority language media journalists, the concept of journalism, or at least its function for the community, might need review and redefinition. The standard criteria of professional journalism should be contextualized and complemented by incorporating a function dedicated to, th to the support and or active defense of the language as part of journalistic activity. Uh, I think it's really important here uh, that they mention that it is the professional journalism that is the foundation, and then we need to modify that in some way, but we're not leaving that behind in any way. Um, in the same study, um, it's a study of how uh, minority language journalists um, think about their mission and their professional roles. So they show that two-thirds uh, two said that uh, they feel that they are also uh, supporters and defenders of their language, in addition to their professional roles as journalists. But that's also to, rem to remember that the one-third does not feel this way. One third only feels as regular journalists. So this is a balance, something to think about. 
Um, I see this language activist function also in, in my own studies with um, Swedish wireless uh, professional journalists, how they feel about their roles. Here are two quotes. Swedish wireless journalists are like ambassadors for the Swedish language in Finland, one of them says, and another one says, I try to insist that our politicians should speak Swedish in interviews. In some way, I guess that is a way to support bilingualism, even though I hadn't really thought about it in that way. So it might not be an active choice, but it's something that they're still working with every day. So if we think about the characteristics of minority language uh, journalism then, uh, if we accept that the mission of w working for the language and the language community is part of minority language journalism, uh, here are some of the influences then we might see. We might see a different perspective on society with a framing of news from a linguistic minority cultural point of view. Uh, this does not mean that you only report on this minority and or uh, only issues directly related to that, but it means having this group in mind when you do journalism and report on everything that's relevant for them, and that might be just about anything. Uh, we could also see a language political agenda setting um, in favor of the language minority with advocates for language rights and mi minority politics, the, the traditional watchdog function of journalism, but with uh, a kind of a language twist. And if we have the goal of empowering the specific language group, uh, that would then be the mission, which I will come back to uh, as the next category. So doing this, while still staying true to journalistic ethic guidelines, is a challenge. And this challenges the cornerstones of journalism as neutrality and objectivity. Um, in journalism research, you don't really talk about objective journalists anymore because that's more or less an, uh, an impossible case. You cannot be totally objective. But you can strive to, to report objectively and neutrally. And um, for example, Burroughs shows that uh, in regards to indigenous journalism, that's not even the, the goal for, for many indigenous journalists. As we could also see in the, the previous uh, session with uh, the Hungarian journalists in Romania. Uh, and the reasoning then is that they provide an alternative uh, view and um, balance out the, the objectivity in, in a greater picture. But this might be uh, a professional challenge for journalists. Uh, in an article by Marcelin et al. about um, a Sami journalism program uh, in Norway, they write about this uh, conflict mm, in, this in this way. Rather, we see it as our task to equip students and potential future researchers with an understanding of the constraints under which they will operate confidence in their journalistic and academic skills and provide them with an environment in which they can explore their understanding of how they resolve the challenge of fusing an indigenous commitment with professional journalistic ethics. So as I see it, um, journalist, uh, minority language journalism is not in conflict with traditional journalism majority language journalism. It's more like an added value. But we do need uh, a conceptual clarification of what minority language journalism is and how it relates to uh, indigenous journalism and to ethnic journalism that are, in my opinion, more clearly defined. Uh, here are two recent um, references that are very good in this respect. So is it journalism by, about, and for a linguistic minor minority? Or isn't it? Cannot everybody do journalism for a linguistic minority? Does it have to be about the linguistic mi minority? I certainly hope not. Uh, and is it for a min linguistic minority? I guess, yes, that is the primary uh, target group. But um, at least if we look at the Swedish media in Finland, a lot of Finnish speaking people uh, take part of that as well to give us different perspective on things. And also uh, a lot of the people from the Nordic countries uh, take part of the Swedish media. So they are, there are many uh, audience target groups. 
but this is an e a field in need of scholarly attention. The mission then for uh, an education program in, in linguistic minority uh, linguistic journalism could be language maintenance, cultivation, management. And I will illustrate this with some s quotes from um, journalists at the Swedish YLE department. They see their role as uh, a model and a mirror, a linguistic role model. I'm a drop in the media ocean, but every drop counts. I feel that it's important to be a linguistic role model. It's a job filled with responsibility. Or the mirror function, a very important dual mission to provide a common standard language for Svensk Finland, which is the Swedish part of Finland, as a whole, but at the same time show the linguistic diversity that exists. They also connect their mission to uh, public service values. Quality, the language has to be good. The language, media language sets the norm for a minority language. To trust, people also trust Wiley when it comes to language, not only that it's correct, but that it's rich and that it improves one's personal language. Here we have the language cultivation aspect. And culture, our own language varieties are part of the culture we are put to manage as part of the public service mission. We also see traditional vitality uh, aspects. It's about making the language visible, to give the audience a chance to hear their own language and to watch television programs in their own language, and to support the identity of a vulnerable minority who does not always recognize its own value. And survival. Uh, Wiley must demonstrate that it's possible to speak and write Swedish without resorting to Finnish words, expressions, or bad translations. Being a part of the only official channel in Sweden in Swedish contains that responsibility, an important part of the survival of the Swedish language in Finland. And finally then, language management. Uh, if we look at the Swedish situation in Finland, th most of the data and the material and the information they're working with is in Finnish. So they do a lot of translating, for example. And they work in close collab collaboration with uh, professional language advisors working with the media houses. And that is something that uh, I think is very important because it gives them security. Uh, we do see some linguistic insecurity among the journalists and they have someone to talk to, they have someone to help them. But if we're thinking about the education then, uh, implications could be that we would include courses in language awareness, um, translation, and maybe minority languages in general. Moving on to contextualization, in what context do we work? And um, that question might seem really easy to answer, of course, the minority language context, but that is not an easy market or an easy society or an easy um, surrounding to describe n necessarily. Uh, Leaving Arsondi is an experienced Sami journalist, and in Marklin Tau she says, it's not enough to know how to ask the questions and then try to find someone who's able to answer these questions. Indigenous journalism must also teach about what are the res responsibilities when we are reporting from indigenous societies. The main question is this, do we understand the societies that we are covering? And I think this is a very, very important question. The minority community might be local, but it might be regional, uh, it might be national, it might be global. Uh, this varies naturally, but it's something that we need to really be aware of. For Swedish speakers in Finland, the Nordic countries are almost considered uh, domestic news, uh, news about them. On the other hand, it's the window to the Nordic countries, so we have all of them as a potential market as well. But when looking at young people, they live in a global world, a social world. And um, changing there the picture, not on my own screen. Uh, this is um, a study of uh, language choices by, uh, online language choices by young Swedish speaking Finns. And I'm sorry, this picture is now in Swedish because it was a picture, so I wasn't able to change the, the, uh, the languages. But the green part is English and the blue part at the bottom is uh, Swedish, and the purple part in the middle is Finnish. So even though we talk a lot about uh, how Swedish-speaking young people are so bilingual and, and Finnish is taking over, we see that their online language behavior is bilingual in another way. It's English and Swedish. 
So how, co how can we take this into account when, when educating the future journalists? Uh, now, finally, moving on to some more concrete and, and hands-on questions. Um, how should the education be organized? What kind of courses should we teach? Uh, how much should it be theory and how much should it be practical courses and so forth? Well, these, you can have different opinions about this, of course. Um, in Sosacom, we, we have a lot of also vocational training, practical courses where they learn the tricks of the trade, so to say. Um, now starting, um, not next week, but the following week, is a three-week um, production period where the journalist students work together in a newsroom, producing content for uh, several media platforms for the, for the web page. It's called Smokka, as you can see there for the web page, for um, a, a, new, um, a magazine, not a newspaper, a magazine, um, for a podcast, for they do radio news, and of course social media content. Working together so that the first year students are reporters, and the second year students do the podcast, and the third year students are, they have read a course in, in journalistic leadership, so they are uh, leading the work and being the news editors. And um, we teachers are more in the background, uh, helping them, giving feedback, and a flipped classroom kind of situation. So this is working very well. This is from a few years back when we could have it in, in person. We've been doing this over Zoom now for two years, but now we are back in the, in the classroom and in the school's news desk. So that's really nice. So this is a, a good way to to use uh, the students' own uh, experiences and knowledges as well. Because, uh, for example, uh, yeah, last year we added TikTok as a f um, news outlet on their initiative. And it has been very successful. We have like 1,500 followers on our TikTok page and we have just had like one year of production. One of the TikToks is about what is uh, Finland, Swedish, and that has m almost 100,000 views. So this is a really a way to reach out. But then we also have the more traditional forms, like the newspaper or the magazine you can see there in the other picture. Uh, and I believe that it's very important to have uh, both vocational and practical courses and more theoretical courses discussing the me media's role in society and what they are actually doing and news reporting and um, social structures. Um, there is also a discussion going on within journalism education about generalists or specialists. Do we need people who know a little bit of everything or people specializing in certain areas? And this is of course an a question without an answer because we need both. Uh, another question is how much should we focus on the traditional media forms, television, video, radio, um, and paper, newspapers, and how much should we focus on the hybrid media forms? And if you ask the industry, uh, they say we want the latter. We want people who are able to work with all the new forms. But then they still expect the former. They still expect them to be able to do the traditional forms of journalism as well. So um, here we have uh, a bit of a a uh, challenge for us as m m educators. But I would say that for a minority media language market, we do need everything we can get. So very important to have different kinds of skills and a close relationship with the industry, if possible, with internships and, s and projects where you work together. Finally, then, there are, of course, many ways you could organize uh, minority language uh, journalist education. It could be a separate unit as for us, uh, where it could be also part of a majority language uh, unit where you could have a lot of help from that. Um, that has to be a local, uh, local decision behind that, of course. One challenge is, as always in minority settings, the potential students, the potential lecturers, uh, are there enough? Um, do we have enough? And here you might think about, do, do they have to be from the minority group or could they be from the majority group or even international? And at least in Finland, as we could hear in the previous lecture as well, that um, 
the gender balance has shifted within journalism. And you can see here some of our graduates from a few years back. So one question is how can we attract more men to journalism? Some conclusions. Um, I would say that minority language journalism education is definitely an understudied area, and I would welcome all kinds of initiatives in this uh, aspect. And it should critically discuss the concept of minority language journalism. We could, through uh, minority language journalism education, strengthen minority language media, both in numbers and in quality. And if we're really serious about this language management aspect, we should include also courses on language skills and language management, language policy um, in the curriculum. We would benefit from collaboration with media outlets uh, in different ways to, re to really meet the demands of the changing industry. And it could provide minority language perspectives to majority language media outlets. And this is also uh, an important part. It's based on an understanding of minority experiences. And I think one, one important question is, are these uh, experiences and, and this understanding transferable to majority language speakers, to other minority groups, for example? How can we work with this uh, as a part of the education? And finally, um, to be able to have minority language uh, journalism education, we need a critical mass of workplaces for these journalists. So we need uh, an industry demand, but we also need a student supply. And I will give this question to you now. Uh, which possibilities do you see in potential collaborations around these aspects on an international level? That would be very interesting to hear. So, tack för er uppmärksamhet. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Jenny. Um, we've got enough time for questions or thoughts and answers to your um, uh, raised questions. So uh, here in the room, we also got the opportunity to, um, or you on Zoom got the opportunity to leave questions in the chat or raise your hands there. But we will begin here. Niels was first and then Olga. Oh, yeah. Hi, I've got two questions. One is, uh, your where do you get, uh, recruit your students from? Are they largely from Finland and are they largely from the minority? I see two nods, so that's, well, thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> I would have had a, a follow-up question as to, for those who are not from the minority or not from Finland, why would they study with you, whether you know anything? And then the other thing that uh, relates a little bit to the question I had yesterday with the panel, when the colleague from the German newspapers said that one of his challenges was to improve the language and we as sort of linguists were like thinking well, what does he mean by improve mm -hmm. the language uh, and we I think we suspected that in the that the German of the German minority will have language contact phenomena from Danish and that his aim was to eradicate it for mm -hmm. somehow my question to you is whether um, how distinct Finland Swedish is from mainland or not can I say mainland but from Sweden Swedish uh, and whether a, you note the differences between Finland Swedish and Sweden Swedish, whether you permit them in your journalism, whether you proscribe them, or whether uh, or whether indeed you strengthen it, i.e., to what extent do you um, emphasize or co um, create an awareness of your students that they are a part of a minority of Swedes in Finland rather than that they're just an appendix to Sweden, linguistically speaking? So yes. Thank you for a very good question. This is just my, my area of interest as well. Uh, but I will keep it short and we can dis continue the discussion later. Um, let's see if I remember all your questions. Um, s well starting with the languages. So it is the same language, Swedish in Finland and Swedish in, s in, in Sweden. Uh, it's a pluricentric language, so we have like different norm centers uh, for Swedish. The differences between uh, Swedish and Finland and Swedish and Sweden are on two levels, I'd say. Uh, a lexical level, we have some Finlandisms that are words that are used uh, ma mainly in Finland or differently in Finland. And they might be 
uh, archaic words, old words that are lost in Sweden or not used uh, in the same way, or, for example, words uh, that are about the Finnish society, that, you know, they don't exist in, in Sweden because the societies are different. The other uh, main difference is pronunciation. So we pronounce uh, differently, and that's how you immediately hear if someone is from Finland or from Sweden. But the language institutes and the language advisors and the language management is really uh, strict on this point that Swedish and Finland should not become a separate language. It has to stick to the norm in Sweden and it like the lexical norm basically and all the writing and grammar and everything. Uh, and that's very important. And, and um, most of the journalists accept this, uh, but not all. They think that we should let our own um, variety blossom and, and evolve. And then, of course, we have the dialects who also, they also influence the standard language. And we hear more of the colloquial language in other genres than news. I have studied the news, which is, of course, the most formal, formal type of language. But um, it's not a separate language. It is the same language, and they follow the same norm. Um, you asked about how l how much we talk about this and how aware the students are. Uh, we do talk about it. We have one lecture in, in Swedish, actually in the language lecture connected to our uh, education program as well. And they are aware that there are differences. We don't talk about it that much because it's not so often relevant. We talk much more about the influence of Finnish or English in the Swedish language uh, among the young people because we see that much more and that's a much bigger problem. Uh, the Finland-Swedish minority is very, very, very interested in its own language and we have a lot of language police. Uh, so uh, we do see in the paper quite often discussions about the bad language in the radio or uh, discussions like that. So uh, it is an issue that is constantly there. And I would say in general, <laughs> We are not talking very much about minority language journalism either, because it's it's like it's it's the underlying ideology in a way. So it's not so often uh, discussed actually in in the courses either. I hope I answered all your questions. Yeah, yeah. you have to learn to ask one at a time. <laughs> That's a journalist advice. Advice. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, over. Hello, and uh, thank you so much. Nice to hear about Svensk Finland. Uh, yeah, maybe I have more than one question, excuse me. But um, it, it I really uh, enjoyed your uh, words, and I would like to understand better the situation in you know Finland, Sweden, uh, and, and also the identity of uh, border areas. Uh, like yesterday, we had this nice... Uh, conversation about Danish German uh, what is the identity of the people living there so for example like you uh, how do you if somebody asks what's your identity between uh, Swedish and and Finnish and uh, then also can you compare like for example Finland has you know two big neighbors Sweden and Russia could you compare the situation in Swedish Finnish border area to the Russian uh, Finnish uh, border area, and then yeah. So I hope my question was not too herpe herpe for you. Herpe <laughs> um, herpe is like gibberish or something like that um, in Finnish. Um, identity first. Uh, my identity is that I'm a Swedish-speaking Finn, so I am from Finland, and that's my national identity. But my language is Swedish, so that's very clear for me. Uh, it might not be as clear for everybody, uh, especially if you have, uh, are, are bilingual uh, and speak Finnish and Swedish just as well. You might not so strongly identify with the, the minority group, but I would never consider myself Swedish. That's not uh, an option. Um, Finland has always been very West-oriented. Um, we have, ha I mean, s since we have the long history with Sweden, we have a lot of cooperation over the, the border, and uh, in the border area in the north part, you don't even notice when you cross the border. 
or at least you didn't before COVID. Mm, I'm not sure how it is now, but it used to be like that. Um, whereas the border to, to Russia is, is much longer and, and much more ideology and mentally hard. <laughs> mm. Is that enough? <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, I'm looking at my big screen here and there's a question from Nicole. Uh, not not in the chat, but it's the cursor. Oh, that's the cursor. Well, it looks like a raised hand. <laughs> 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 so, are there questions uh, by the audience, uh, Ellen? Hi, uh, thank you very much. Um, it's kind of following up from from the previous discussion around language. Um, standards or the debate around that and I think that you mentioned in one of the earlier slides that part of the education program is to have sort of language uh, classes and so on and that there would be possibly language sort of correction roles if I understood correctly as part of the um, the media environment um, for Swe Swedish in Finland. Would that also be the case for Finnish in, in Finland in terms of the media sector that there is a, you know, that there's a clear role for language correction or editorial uh, linguistic correction and so forth? So that's kind of my question, whether, whether we're looking at something that's quite reciprocal, well not reciprocal, that's not the right word, but that there is a parity, if you like, that this is something that happens culturally in Swedish and Finland, but it's also something that happens culturally in Finnish in, in Finland. Thank you, that's a good question. Um, there is uh, a person working, I'm not sure about the, the newspaper houses actually, uh, but I know that in YLE there is a person working with the language uh, in the Finnish uh, news uh, department as well. But their role is different. It's more like how to pronounce uh, foreign names and, and the politics about, I mean, Ukrainian cities' names, how should we pronounce them and what's the policy about that. That More that kind of role. And of course, in some respect also give how do we spell this or that. But uh, it's not as active and it's not as focused on, on correction as, as I would say it is in the, the Swedish language department. And um, I mean, journalism is made through language. So I guess in every media outlet, you are working with language and maybe correction in some way. So that's just part of the trade. But um, the ideological aspect is, is very clear, uh, clearly present, I would say, in the Swedish newsrooms. And they also, the dialogue with the language advisors is, is active. Mm. Thank you. Sergis. Super, thanks, Kauke. I mean, that was great, Yanni. So I, I in particular, I, I mean, I liked everything, but the last slide in particular, because I can already sort of think about the whole research project. <laughs> <laughs> can, that can, but no, and I'm serious about this. Um, for example, you know, this is kind of a comment, but then I will move to a question. You know, this linkage is between professional, but also ethnic, linguistic identity, because I think that it's also interesting in our context, our, I mean, Danish-German borderland and kin state minorities, because there sometimes when you read minority language newspapers, this closeness to the community is such that sometimes you wonder, they are not only language activists, they are even political activists mm -hmm. in a way, because they are the voice of the minority. Of course, there are also umbrella organizations and so on, but, but I think that this is very strong aspect of this. So that would be amazing, I think, to even scrutinize just this aspect, mm -hmm. you know, in different contexts, of course. So this was the broader comment, and um, we, we got to talk, you <laughs> know? And then in terms of the, the question, and this is also like linked to, to example from, from our border region, because for example, on the side of the German minority in Denmark, 
there is a bit of a, let's say, expertise traffic between the minority community and then, and then the kin state. Uh, that's mostly due to the fact that the minority is small, so sometimes there's just no, there's no numerical potential to produce experts in different, in different issues. So some of the journalists are actually, you know, working in, in, in Denmark now for German language media, but they are originally from Germany with expertise, you know, in the kin state media market. Um, and and uh, in your sp from your speech, I got the impression that the Swedish uh, language media sphere in Finland is sort of, uh, you know, self-reliant in a sense that people like you just train journalists. But but I wonder, is there any kind of this sort of competences, expertise, traffic between Sweden and Swedish-speaking sphere of Finland in terms of yeah people, ideas, you know, in the context of media, of course. Yes, definitely. Uh, um at least we do get a lot of impressions from Sweden and, and follow closely what they're doing there. So definitely in that sense. Uh, also the traffic of people. Uh, I mean, a lot of people are moving to Sweden because the job market is so so much bigger there. And um, But also some coming to Finland. So we do have Swedish, Swedish journalists working in the Finland Swedish media. So absolutely. Um, when thinking about experts, uh, one of the hard questions always for a Finland-Swedish journalist is should I interview s the expert in this subject in Finnish or should I interview the next best person in Swedish? Uh, so this is of course something that they have to on a daily basis um, think about. Uh, of course now with COVID we've learned to interview in in different ways as well. So now, I mean, the Swedish expert market is also open in another way than perhaps before. Uh, so, but yeah, m maybe more from Sweden to I ideas from Sweden to Finland than the other way around, but maybe more f people going into Sweden than the other way around. Mm. So we've got two more questions. Um, first here in the audience and then on Zoom, but first Craig. My question was basically the same as Sergius's, and I guess that just shows we spend too much time <laughs> together. <laughs> um, but just to add a small bit onto the end, I wonder if you could maybe unpack a little bit how much or whether uh, Sweden is seen as a kin state. I know from our previous conversations, I think when we look at comparative minority studies, it's often an easy assumption that if a language has a majority country elsewhere, then it's the kin state. But I don't think it's quite the same uh, in the Sweden, Finland. Mm. And so these comparisons to the border region here or to the Hungarian and Romanian earlier are not quite so straightforward to apply to this case. So maybe just, I was going to ask more about the journalist, how that reflects on journalists, but you already answered that part of the question. So mm. Yeah, well, I guess it depends on how you define kin state and what that implies. Um, there is a... a cultural resemblance uh, and, and a, a big interest, but the interest is more from the minor, from Finland's side to Sweden. And I mean, there is no financial support or any other kind of support coming from Sweden to Finland. Uh, I would say many, in still many in Sweden do not even know that people speak Swedish in Finland. So we're not, it's not like Swedes that have moved to Finland. So that's a big difference that it's not in that sense, uh, maybe considered a kin state, but um, there are other people probably more better equipped to answer that question than I am. Okay, then um, Jitzke um, has another question. Yes, hello. <laughs> Um, uh, I uh, uh, also asked uh, something uh, this morning, but I'll introduce myself again. I I'm working for uh, Omrop Friesman, which is the Frisian um, broadcasting company. And what I recognize in the story very much is that um, um, we would like to train a new group of journalists um, uh, that, uh, well, have professional skills, uh, and also are um, skilled in the language, uh, in the Frisian language, but they also have to learn about the Frisian culture and everything in it. And we have noticed that there's no uh, attention for that in, in our journalistic, um, um, how do you call that, journalistic uh, um, uh, schools. And 
um, not in the, trans the language schools as well. So now we have started um, a cooperation with, um, uh, with the university and with some two newspapers to train uh, uh, some, some uh, to train uh, three trainees every year um, in language, in Frisian culture, uh, and we hope to create a curriculum uh, for the journalistic uh, schools. And I, I would really be interested in, in what you have learned and maybe we could uh, learn from each other because you, you have said, uh, you were wondering in your last sheet, uh, are these things transferable? Uh, I think so, but I would really be interested in your views on that. Yes, thank you. That's uh, very interesting to hear. Oh, sorry, interesting to hear, and and uh, very good initiative that you have there. Um, when thinking about the the Swedish minority in Finland, since most of our students belong to that, so they don't need the the cultural introduction in that sense. But I do believe that a lot of the experiences and the, the framework of referencing in their lives are transferable, just, just as you said as well. Being part of a minority is something else than being part of a majority. But of course, I mean, there are very many types of minorities and, and uh, it doesn't have to be necessarily a linguistic minority to so that you should be able to, to feel the same types of feelings and have the same experiences. Um, but when thinking about education and, and journalistic profession, it's really hard to, I think it's hard to learn that if you haven't experienced it yourself. Uh, you can learn it on a theoretical level, of course, but do you really understand what it means to not, exa for example, get answers in that minority language from an interview person? Or does it make such a big difference if you're not part of that language minority? I'm not sure. This is something that I think would be really good to discuss more. And I don't have a clear answer for you, unfortunately. That's why I also posed the question to you. I was hoping to get some answers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it's an interesting subject. And I think it's something that should be discussed in, in the future. Thank you. OK, we've got um, one, two. Elin, you also. few minutes left, so then I will, yeah, very short one. Very short question about Oland's region mm. uh, of Finland. Sorry for asking about this question, but um, majority of Oland population are co also considered to be um, Swedes instead of Swedish speaking Finns. So um, what about the journalistic, um, your approach uh, to regional journalism in Oland? Uh, I wouldn't say they're considered to be Swedes. Uh, they're considered to be Ålendingar, <laughs> living in Åland. They don't necessarily uh, identify as Finland Swedes. They fe feel that's the people living in Finland and they live in Åland. So, but they're not Swedes either, so they're their they're own people. Um, well, the Åland uh, media landscape is really interesting because they have two newspapers and radio and television content and um, that's mainly thanks to uh, a very generous um, local businessman funding one of the papers at least. Um, I think they are doing really well. Uh, they have a really high uh, journalistic standard in their uh, output and they, they, uh, they have this competition. So that's why they're really working hard. So the journalistic quality is, is good there, even though it's a really small local or a, a small context, which usually means that it's more like uh, smaller news as well. But I think they're doing really well. And they have this watchdog function very much, very strongly um, visible, especially regarding Finnish authorities and, and how they don't get service in Swedish from the mainland and, and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. it's an interesting case study. OK. Um, one more question before coffee break. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm just thinking to what you were saying um, during the presentation about, you know, journalists, are they working in the language or are they working for the language? And just thinking, you know, one of the 
One of the things that really um, left an impression on me when I first um, heard of uh, Swedish in, in Finland, you know, many years ago, was that you had this idea where Finland would be playing ice hockey against Sweden, and that the fin uh, the Swedish speaking Finns would be shouting and cheering for Finland to win, but in Swedish, you know, and so that mm -hmm. sort of really encapsulated something about the whole situation for me. So just thinking really in terms of, you know, that bigger question, are you working in the language or are you working for the language? Um, your national identity is very clear. Your national identity is very stable. Presumably, there is a um, difference of opinion across a range of political issues within the Swedish-speaking community in Finland, that some people perhaps are more conservative and other people are more sort of progressive or radical or whatever, or right and left wing and so on. So when would the journalists need to position themselves as for the language? Would that be really only confined to conditions where the whole of the language community, its existence, its right to exist, is being threatened by the very state to which the minority, no, no, the co-official language speakers have, you know, the same level of allegiance as the majority language speakers. You're hardly sort of a separatist uh, group of people. So is it is it only within those kinds of circumstances where you would, where the journalists would see them themselves as working for the language rather than just in the language? Thank you, that's a very good question. Um, no, not only in those extreme cases. Uh, I would say that in almost every newspaper, every day in, in the newspapers, you see some news that has a language aspect or a language angle. It can be how many wrote the, about the national curriculum or the that's matriculation exam, how many took the exam in Swedish this year, oh, it's less than last year, okay, we are, you know, doom, doom is here, uh, or whatever. It the language is very much a part of the framing of all news uh, in some way. So um, I do think that they s not necessarily think about this role very often, but it's there underlying their whole uh, journalistic again agenda. So I smaller issues to these really big issues. Mm. And yes, you are definitely right. We have the Finland uh, Swedes are on over the whole political specter and, and just have the same characteristics as, as the Finnish-speaking majority. Okay, thank you very much, Jenny, and uh, thanks also to the audience for, for the um, vivid discussion today. Um, I think there obviously is need to come back to Flensburg. Sergius still has questions, wants to get in touch. Um <laughs> and I haven't mentioned your recent project on uh, social media language practices among uh, teenagers and uh, young adults. So there's a lot to exchange and I hope this won't be the last time that we hear and see you here in Flensburg. Thank you very much for this keynote. Thank you. <laughs>